We're looking now at uh, Jeremiah chapter 15. Um, just a couple little points before we uh, jump into this. Uh, first of all, uh, as we start to move along now into the further chapters, the midsections of Jeremiah, I may go a little quicker in each chapter, just give a synopsis or overview, uh, just a very brief outline because we're dealing with like 50 chapters here, 52 chapters. Uh, and I like to get on to other things. But if we come across a chapter that uh, we ought to spend some time on, we, we will do that. The other point is I got my grandchildren visiting today. And so if you hear a little voices and so on, that's what it is. So I'm sure you won't mind that at all. So uh, Jeremiah uh, chapter 15, and this is in response to, of course, what has happened in chapter 14, where the, the people are pleading for mercy uh, <clears throat> to God. Uh, and then it says in chapter 15, verse 1, Then the Lord said to me, that is the Lord said to, to Jeremiah, Even if Moses and Samuel stood before me, my mind would not be fa favorable towards this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. And it shall be, if they say to you, where should we go? Then you shall tell them, thus saith the Lord, such as for, are for death to death, such as are for the sword to the sword, such as are for the famine to the famine, and such as for the captivity to the captivity. Basically, what the Lord is telling Jeremiah here is, is not to intercede for the people, not to pray for them, not to intercede for them. And he's saying that even if Moses and Samuel stood before me, uh, I, I would not hear their intercessory prayers. You know, both Moses and uh, Samuel were known for their intercession for God's people. We see in Exodus chapter 32 where uh, Moses interceded for the people in connection with the sin of the golden calf. And then we find with uh, Samuel uh, in uh, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 12, where he says, you know, God forbid that I should cease to pray for you uh, in connection with the, the people of Israel. And so they were both prayer warriors, intercessors of God's people. But even, even if two such great intercessors stood before me, the Lord says, I, I would not hear them. You know, we're reminded in this regard in, in Ezekiel chapter uh, 14, a similar thing that the Lord tells Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse 14 even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says God, says the Lord God. And that's repeated uh, in uh, verse 20 of, Ex of uh, Ezekiel 14. Even though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither son nor daughter. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. So pretty solemn state of things that we've we've come to here in this chapter, in this uh, uh, period of Jeremiah's ministry. Uh, and so this sort of continues on, uh, verse 1 to 4. Uh, it's the same idea. Uh, verse uh, 3 speaks of this um, destruction, this judgment, that they would be devoured by the beasts of the field, you know, <clears throat> We can understand that literally and metaphorically um, when uh, the siege would happen and the bodies would be slain, lain on the field of the slaughtered Israelites and, and those of Jerusalem and Judea by the Babylonians. Uh, the birds of the, of the air and the beasts of the earth would feed upon them. But metaphorically, we might understand also is that these animals are actually descriptive of the Gentile powers that will devour them and destroy them. So we can understand it both ways. Probably both are true. Uh, and then verse 4 sort of ends this uh, little bit of, of a section. And I will hand them over to trouble to all the kingdoms of the earth uh, because of Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, king of Judah, for what he did in Jerusalem. So this is a, a, an interesting point here. He brings out Manasseh and the sins of Manasseh, the crimes of Manasseh, are one of the reasons why this judgment would be would be coming upon them and why they would be taken into captivity into Babylon. It was there's multiple reasons. One, they didn't allow the, the Sabbaths of the land. They didn't allow the land to rest every seven years. We get that at the end of Second Chronicles uh, because of their uh, social injustice. 
uh, of the ruling elites. Uh, this comes out in the prophet Micah and the prophet Amos, and also their idolatry and their fornication and so on, their unrighteousness, uh, especially the idolatry. Uh, but here we get the crimes of Manasseh stated as a reason. Uh, it's, it's quite a story. We can't go into all the details of Manasseh. You can read about it in, in 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 1 to 18, and 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verse 10 to 20, where we get more details. But he was one of the most wicked kings that Israel ever had, of Judah particularly. And he reigned for 55 years, I believe it was, if memory serves me correct. But he uh, uh, murdered people. The blood of people filled the streets of Jerusalem. He committed horrible, idolatrous practices, uh, offering children up in the fire, and uh, all sorts of immorality, and and occult practices, and witchcraft, and anything you can think of <laughs> that was bad and evil. Manasseh did it as the king. Interesting sidebar to this is that Manasseh himself repented, and and that comes out in Second Chronicles, I believe. He actually, and some have called him the the uh, prodigal of the Old Testament, the prodigal son of the Old Testament, because Hezekiah, his dad, uh, was a godly man, and to have such a son as Manasseh, but he he came back, you know, he repented and he changed his ways, but for the nation it was too late, you know, and this shows us a distinction between uh, God's uh, the, God's government and God's grace. God's grace in that. Uh, uh, we see that God forgave Manasseh, but God's government is that judgment was still come upon the nation because Manasseh wasn't alone in doing this. Uh, his, uh, you know, government, his bureaucracy, his people, uh, those who supported them were all involved in these crimes as well. So it was going to come upon the whole nation, although I believe uh, Manasseh personally uh, became a believer in the end and, and was saved. I'm using Christian terminology here. Uh, but he, he seemed to genuinely repent, and God received him back. <clears throat> so we move on, verse 5. Uh, verse 5 uh, to 9, we get uh, some more descriptions of the judgment uh, to come. You know, in verse 7, or at the end of verse 6, God says, I'm weary of relenting or repenting. I'm tired of it, God says, you know, for, the, for their uh, going back and for their turning aside. Uh <clears throat> And really, it's this description, these verses, verse 5 to 9, is a description of the siege warfare, where they would be under the siege of the Babylonians, and um, and the the bad things that would would happen upon, uh, upon them, would, that would come upon them, I should say. And, um, for example, verse 9, she languishes, who was born seven. She has breathed her last. Her son has gone down while there's yet day. Uh, she has been ashamed and confounded, uh, and the remnant of them that I will deliver the sword before their enemies, says the Lord. So uh, there, there would be women who were widows, and they would be also bereaved of their children, of their sons, uh, because of the warfare that would come upon them. And uh, <clears throat> so Jeremiah is warning them about this and telling them that this was going to come upon them, that I mean, it was it was the Lord, it was God speaking through uh, Jeremiah here, and that he would not change uh, what was about to happen. Uh, it, it, it was they crossed the Rubicon, and there was no going back, and um, God's judgment uh, was coming. And then uh, in verse ten, we get Jeremiah's heart revealed, and Jeremiah is in dejection. He feels rejected by the people. Although he, his heart is broken for the people, he feels rejected by them. And he's, um, it's basically, you know, he's not popular. <laughs> it's, it's about his unpopularity. And that's a hard thing to deal with. You know, if you tell God's people the truth and you become unpopular because you're telling them the truth, it's hard to bear. So in verse 10, woe is me, Jeremiah says, my mother, my mother, that you have borne me a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. I have neither lent for interest, nor have men lent to me for interest, yet every one of them curses me. Jeremiah says, basically, I've lived in a godly way. I haven't uh, lent them money for a high interest rate. I haven't charged them interest on money, and I haven't borrowed money from them for interest. It's just a metaphorical way of saying that 
he, he lived righteously before them. He never ripped them off. You know, he didn't uh, deceive them. He didn't steal from them. He didn't take from them. Um, but yet they hated him. But they hated him for the, for the truth. And he concludes this little um, ex uh, note of exasperation, his dejection here. He's at a low point. Every one of them curses me. You know, that's, that's tough. You know, when every one of God's people cursed him and he felt it. But this is a real statement of his inner feelings here. You know, it says in, in the epistle of James uh, that these men, these prophets of God, uh, these great worthies of the Old Testament times, they were men of like passions as us. They had the same feelings. They had the same foibles. They had the same times of dejection and, and discouragement. And so uh, Jeremiah is giving voice to that now. If you recall in uh, chapter 12, uh, verse 5, you'll remember that the Lord warned him about that, where he said to Jeremiah, if you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, then how will, uh, will you contend with the horses? In other words, Jeremiah, you know, if you're having trouble now, just wait till it gets worse. <laughs> They're going to hate you even more. And so at this point now, Jeremiah is running with the horses. But it's tough. It was tough. It was hard for him. And so you get this note of exasperation and dejection uh, coming uh, from Jeremiah. And then, but verse 11 we get the Lord's expression of care for him. And we're going to have to look a little bit at the translation here because there's a little bit of a tough uh, uh, phrase to translate in the Hebrew and there's some different translations that put it slightly a different way. The one I'm reading now, the New King James says, surely, this is verse 11, the Lord said, surely it will be well with your remnant. Surely I will cause the enemy to intercede with you in the time of adversity and in the time of affliction. Uh, of affliction rather so he's speaking of the remnant the, the remnant of the faithful ones in israel uh that you know god would have mercy upon him but it's that's sort of out of key and out of tune with what had just proceeded where god's judgments were coming he's not speaking of a remnant at all in this chapter uh, and i like how the darby translation puts it it's a little more directed uh, to jeremiah personally so uh, chapter 15, verse 11 from the Darby translation has, Verily I will set thee free for thy good. Verily I will cause the enemy to meet thee kindly in the time of evil and in the time of affliction. In other words, what the Lord is saying, Jeremiah, when, when Nebuchadnezzar and his armies do come, uh, they will treat you kindly. Uh, they won't kill you. You will be preserved. I'm going to look after you, Jeremiah. Don't worry about it. And so it's a nice statement of the Lord's care for him. He needed to, he needed to hear that. And then uh, verse 12 uh, to verse 14, we get uh, more of uh, thoughts about the uh, captivity that would come. Verse 12 is, can any one break iron, the northern iron and the bronze? The northern iron uh, is uh, the nation of Babylon. Uh, your wealth and your treasures I will give us plunder without price because of all your sins throughout your territories. And I will make you uh, cross over with your enemies into a land which you do not know, for fire is kindled my anger, which shall burn upon you. So uh, it's a plain prophecy about the coming Babylonian captivity. And then verse 15 to 18, we get Jeremiah's prayer. And... Uh, it's, a, it's a, a nice expression coming from Jeremiah here. He says in verse 15, O Lord, you know, remember me and visit me and uh, take vengeance for me on my persecutors. You know, this is what we call an imprecatory prayer. Uh, he um, is praying because of those who cursed him that we saw at the end of verse 10. An imprecatory prayer is what we find in the Old Testament. Sometimes we find in the Psalms where they pray for God's intervention uh, upon their enemies. Now, imprecatory prayer isn't, isn't something that a Christian of the New Testament era, era, the New Covenant era, that we're living in the day of grace, uh, we're not called to do that. In fact, uh, the Lord Jesus told us uh, that we are to bless our enemies and don't return evil for evil and turn the other cheek. But uh, Jeremiah was not yet in the Christian dis dispensation. He was a, a Jew. 
and under the old covenant and this is perfectly acceptable and so um uh, the Lord, uh, he tells the Lord, he prays to the Lord, remember me and visit me, take vengeance on my persecutors, verse 15, in your enduring patience, do not take me away, know that for your sake, uh, I have suffered rebuke, Jeremiah is saying, the reason I'm, I'm suffering here is for your sake, Lord, remember that, and then verse 16, your words were found, and I ate them, and your word to me was the joy and rejoicing of my heart, uh, uh, Jeremiah's expressing how when God originally called him and gave him the message and gave him his word, it was joy and rejoicing of, of his heart that God should use him, that God should give him this word, give him this burden, give him this message. And he felt very special, you know, and he rejoiced in it. But of course, once you declare it, then some of the shine wears off and he's uh, uh, experiencing bitterness and, and, and persecution uh, for that word that he had had preached, although when it was originally given to him, Jeremiah says, your word to, was to me uh, the joy and rejoicing of my heart. We shouldn't understand this as uh, meaning the word of God, the Bible. Um, at that time, the Bible really just consisted basically of the Pentateuch. Not all the prophets had been written. Um, uh, perhaps and the, most of the Psalms had been written, of course, uh, but not entirely. Uh, so uh, we, we uh, don't want to understand this to be the Bible as we understand it that Jeremiah is talking about, but, but specifically the word that was given to him by the Lord. We see this with the prophets on, on several occasions. For example, in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 3, uh, Ezekiel says a similar thing. In verse 3 of chapter 3, Ezekiel says, uh, uh, And he said to me, Son of man, or actually it's the Lord speaking to Ezekiel. Son of man, feed your belly and fill your stomach with this scroll that I will give you. So I ate and it was in my mouth like honey and sweetness. So here we get the explanation for what I've been describing here with Jeremiah. This is specific uh, word that was given to Ezekiel, the prophecy that was given to him. And it's described as a scroll and he was, he was to eat it and would be a sweetness in his belly. But then we get the same thing with the, the Apostle John in, in the uh, uh, book of Revelation, chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. It says, And an angel, I, I went to the angel, John says, and he said to me, Give me, uh, give me the little book. And he said to me, uh, Take and eat it, and I will make your stomach bitter. It will be sweet as honey to your mouth. Uh, then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. And he said to me, you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. So this little book that the Apostle John received was the prophecies concerning the, the judgment of the nations that he had to declare here in the book of Revelation. And when he ate it, 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 just like Jeremiah, it was sweet to his mouth. It was like the, the joy and rejoicing of his heart, just like we have with Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16. But then that that sweetness turned to bitterness uh, in, his, in his stomach because of the, the heavy burden that the message bore, and with Jeremiah's case, because of his persecutors. So Jeremiah goes on, verse 16, at the end of verse 16, for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts, I did not sit in the assembly of the mockers, nor did I rejoice. Uh, I sat alone because of your hand, for you have filled me with indignation. Why is my pain perpetual and my wound incurable, which refuses to be healed? Will you surely be to me like a, an unreliable stream as the waters that fail? So Jeremiah is really uh, obviously here at, at a low, low point and uh, somewhat discouraged. Uh, and we get this a few times in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, one of the things I'm, you're struck with the prophets, you know, like Jeremiah or Jonah, some of the other ones, how honest they were in their prayers. It never hurts to tell God exactly how we feel. And when we're going through something that we can express it to him, we do so reverently, but we can be real uh, and, and, and uh, share our heart's burden. But then we get the Lord's uh, reassurance to Jeremiah in verses 19 to 21. He says, the Lord says to him, verse 19, if you return 
then I will bring you back. And from that, we get that Jeremiah was really, you know, in, in a bit of a bad way, uh, emotionally, probably more than anything. He wasn't going into sin. But the Lord says, you shall stand before me. If you take out the precious from the vial, you shall be as my mouth. Let them return to you, but you must not return to them. Um, so the Lord's telling Jeremiah, you know, you shall stand before me. You still will be my prophet. Only take the precious from the vial. Separate out the bad things, Jeremiah. Don't mix yourself up with these people. You see, Jeremiah, he so loved the nation and loved the people. He wasn't mixed up with their sin, but he uh, uh, tried to intercede for them and identify with them and, and so on. And he felt the bitterness of rejection, of being persecuted by them for nothing, for no reason other than telling them the truth. But the Lord says, you know, you know separate the pressure from the vow, uh, and you will be as my mouth. Let them return to you, but you must not return to them. You Let them repent and let them come to you, but you don't have to to basically lower yourself and go to them. You know, this reminds me so much of Second Timothy chapter 2. You know, the thought of separation, taking the pressures from the vial, and then becoming as, as God's mouth. Second Timothy chapter 2, uh, verse t uh, 20, we'll start in verse 20. Yeah. But in a great house, that is the great house, the house of God, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, separating the precious from the vile, uh, just like Jeremiah. And then if he does that, he'll be a, a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. And that's exactly what the Lord told Jeremiah. You separate the precious from the vile. Separate yourself from the evil vessels. Don't go into them. Let them come into you. And you shall be as my mouth. You know, we can't help people by mixing ourselves up with them. You know, there has to be an element of separation. And the separation was happening to Jeremiah by the force of circumstances, them persecuting him and rejection, rejecting him, and he felt it deeply. But the Lord's encouraging here, him here to, no, uh, Jeremiah, just keep standing for me, separate the pressures from the vial, and, and, and you shall be as my mouth. And then verse 20, and I will uh, make to you, uh, the, as this people, a fortified brown, bronze wall, wall. I will make you like a bronze wall, uh, Jeremiah. They, they, they won't be able to hurt you. And they will fight against you, but they will not prevail against you. You will be like that bronze wall. They can, you know, sticks and stones may break your bones, but names will never hurt me. And they're not going to be able to hurt you because I'm going to protect you, Jeremiah. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, says the Lord. And I will deliver you from the hand of the wicked and I will redeem you from the grip of the terrible. So we get some strong encouragements in this chapter from the Lord to Jeremiah uh, that, first of all, uh, the Babylonians wouldn't hurt him. Uh, we saw that earlier. His enemies wouldn't hurt him. The Lord would care for him and spare him. And, this, and the enemies of God's people would, would, uh, would not be able to hurt Jeremiah. Uh, they would take Jeremiah in. But then, uh, on the other hand, his enemies within the nation itself would not be able to hurt him for all their efforts to persecute him and revile him. So we can draw encouragement from this as well, uh, to continue to stand for the Lord uh, in an evil world where everything is opposed to God's interests. To stand, separate the pressures from the vile, be a vessel to honor, uh, take the place outside the camp bearing his reproach. And the Lord says, you will be as my mouth. Uh, you will be a, a vessel to honor, fit for the master's service. May the Lord bless you today. Amen.